Let's turn to the passage that Tammy read for us today. Luke chapter 24. We all know that uh, uh, Luke was a Greek physician. He's very, very well educated. And we can see this come forth. He uses a very unique word in the resurrection scenario that only a doctor would use. But uh, it's a fascinating account, Luke chapter 24, Luke 24, 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. One of the accounts says they were startled that the body wasn't there. While they were wondering about this, suddenly... Two men in clothes, gleaming like lightning, stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? They're getting right to the point. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man, Ben-Adam, must be delivered over to the hands of sinners and be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all those things to the 11. Remember they had been reduced to 11. They were 12, but Judas betrayed Jesus. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the, the apostles. But when they did not believe the women because the words seemed to them like nonsense, Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened." And then turn with me, if you would. We didn't put this in the bulletin, but this is uh, my sermon notes here. Powerful moment. The picture of the resurrected Lord Jesus, Revela uh, Revelation chapter 1. When John saw Jesus, Revelation 1, 17, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Anyone have car keys with them? Good. Just I just want everybody to wave their keys. Let's take a moment keys don't lose those keys those keys are very important but there are some keys that are even more important and it's the keys that we just spoke about Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades and he walks to extend them to us but Lord be with us in these moments thank you for your hand upon our lives bringing faith hope and love to all of the world in your precious name Jesus we pray and everyone said amen, amen. Courage is not the absence of fear. We struggle with fear, but courage overcomes. We must learn how to stand in awe of God more than we stand in awe of circumstance or a situation or what is going on in the world or the latest pandemic or the next one or whatever situation. Faith never denies problems, but defies them and learns how to overcome them. Let me read that again. This is from last Sunday's message. Faith never denies the problem, but learns how to defy the problem and overcome them in the love and truth of God. Michael Green, in his excellent book on the resurrection, uh, writes, and I quote, it's on your outline there, uh, April 9th, 2023. Christianity does not hold the resurrection to be one of many tenets of belief, but without faith in the resurrection, there would be no Christianity at all. 
everything hinges on the truth and the reality of the resurrection. Once dis disprove it and you have disposed of Christianity. There were two guys over the course of the last 50 years who knew how true that one, what that really was. Josh McDowell wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And he wrote several books following along that line. But in the course of making his research, uh, he discovered that he believed. And it transformed his life. Another man by the name of Lee Strobel, who was uh, an investigative Chicago Tribune reporter, was so angry at God. And I find oftentimes that what keeps people from God is not atheism, but anger. They're just angry at God that they're not running the universe and God is. And if they were running the universe, they wouldn't do it quite the same way. So they get angry at God and things don't happen quite the way they would like them to happen. So they just get back at God by saying, I'm not going to believe in him. But um, Lee Strobel was angry at God because his wife in the midst of a crisis came to faith in Jesus and she became a different woman. Lee Strobel was very angry about that, very angry about that. And uh, it was a powerful moment. Lee Strobel said to himself, I am going to disprove the reality of Jesus Christ by discovering that the resurrection was nothing but a hoax. So for the next three years, he set out to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. And then he found out that there was so much evidence to the contrary that he became a believer in Jesus. Now has several, several books and became a Presbyterian pastor. So it's, it's, it's a powerful thing and that illustrates that the disprove the resurrection and it all falls apart. No one has been able to disprove it though. Once disprove it, and you have disposed of Christianity, but it won't happen. In fact, God even welcomes the search. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus does not resist the, the search, the inquiry. He has chutzpah. There are so many people who are so unbelievably so unbelievably unable to withstand difficulty in this world. And they become victims because life is so difficult. Instead of being more than a conqueror through Christ who loves us. The call for those who believe in Jesus and the resurrection is to live it out and show the unbelieving word, world that he is indeed risen. Calvin Miller said the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the epicenter of Christianity. And again, let me underline the call. It's one thing to believe in your mind. It's one thing to have a head of intellectual Christianity. It's quite another thing to lay down your life for someone else. It's quite another thing for someone in a church setting to go out of their way to bless someone who doesn't necessarily measure up to the standards. Someone who pursues a person who's broken and wounded. This world is such a beautiful place, but it's also very broken. And when you find broken people, you may think of them as unlovable, not worthy of your love. But how many of you know God so loved the world? that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Instead of allowing another victim to bite the dust, we need to learn how to build people up and encourage them and do what Jesus did in my life. Love me when I was unlovable. Love me when, how many of you remember B.B. King? B.B. King is a black gospel singer, and he's really, really, really good. I saw him about five times in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But he had this song, and he was kind of like a stand-up comedian. B.B. King had this song, Nobody Loves Me But My Mama, and Sometimes I Think She's Jiving Too. <laughs> that was really the name of the song. And uh, that warmed my heart towards B.B. King. And then later on I found out that that was his way of preaching the gospel. 
He came to faith through, guess who, his mother. He came to faith through his mother when he was unlovable and gave his heart to Jesus as a teenage kid. And he said, the gospel saved me from a multitude of terrible decisions that I had made. B.B. King, true story. But remember Josh McDowell and Lee Strobel. They were investigative Chicago Tribune reporters. No amount of evidence will convince the hardened heart. Let me underline that. No amount of evidence, however, will convince the hardened heart. If you are angry at God, if you're angry at this church or that church or this pastor or that pastor or pastor's wife, whatever it might be, Dory, you're not off the hook. No amount of evidence will convince an angry victim person. If you become a victim through the church, that's your testing ground to grow up. To learn how to grow up. But these, these are four points that I felt God was speaking to, uh, to our church about. Number one, we become ambassadors of reconciliation to a badly divided world in a badly divided church. Uh, Dory is recording my every word, so you know, be merciful to me. But I heard about something this morning about a local church. It got me really upset. It got me really angry. And Dory's going right now, if you follow through with this... <laughs> But it was like, okay, my sermon's in the can, right? I already got have my sermon ready to grow, roll. And somebody tells me something about another church, and I am, I am really upset. Forget the sermon. I'm going to preach on the point of what this I think this church shouldn't be doing and what they now should be doing. And it's like, oh, yeah, right out of your message. What a beautiful heart. What a beautiful spirit you have. And all of a sudden, I realized what I was doing. And I had to go close the door, get on my knees and say, Lord, my heart is hardened right now. And no amount of evidence will convince the hardened heart. I had written that the night before, and now I have to apply it to this heart. Otherwise, don't bother showing up in church. We don't need one more hypocrite in church, right? Isn't that what they say? We don't, we, I don't want to go to church because church is filled with nothing but hypocrites. How many of you have ever heard that? How many of you have ever said that? How many of you have ever been a hypocrite? But you and I become ambassadors of reconciliation to a badly divided world and church. And you, if you don't think that has something to do with the resurrection, I'll prove you wrong right now. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation. What comes out of our mouths, people are listening. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter, and people are watching. Words left unspoken, deeds left undone. Words left unspoken, Deeds left undone. The Lord is listening and the Lord is watching our actions 24 7. And He's there to help us, He's there to encourage us. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due for the things done in the body, whether those things were good or whether those things were bad. And then verse 11, since then, we know what it is to stand in awe of the Lord, fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is, what we are is plain to God. He's not confused about me. He knows the problems I have in my heart and my spirit and how I can very easily harden my heart. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again or def defend ourselves, but we are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. <laughs> there it is. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for 
God, if we are in our right mind, it is for you. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Let me underline that, that verse. He died for all. Who is all? How do you define all? God so loved the world. What does the world mean? It means everybody. He died for all so that all who live should no longer just live for me, myself, and mine. Come to faith in Jesus and you, you get free this. Come to Jesus and you get free that. Everything's free. There's no laying down of your life anymore. He died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old life is gone and the new life has come. Say, thank you, Lord. I don't have to live that old life anymore. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them anymore. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Underline that. He has committed to us a message of reconciliation. If you think you are better than someone else because you have more knowledge, more skill, more experience, you, you realize the trouble that you are in. He has committed to us a message of reconciliation to a badly divided world and church. He died for all so that all who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. We should get her a microphone. Do you want to preach, honey? Yeah? She said yes. <laughs> oh, what a precious moment. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are healing this little one of cancer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are healing her of cancer in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. The angel's challenging words are powerful. The angel's challenging words are very powerful to us to remember what Jesus said. It's a powerful moment in Scripture. This, the, the resurrection message is knocking on the door. He is not here, the angel said. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. Remember how he told you. How many of you are listening to what Jesus says to them? Remember how he told you. Your parents, what did I say again? What did I tell you? What do parents frequently say to their children? What did I tell you? What did I tell you? Don't you remember what I said? Uh, <laughs> uh, what was it? What was it that you said? <laughs> they remembered his words. Jesus had told them eight, nine, ten times. I have several of the verses down there from John's gospel, Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, Luke's gospel. Jesus said, the son of man is going to go to Jerusalem, be betrayed, and he is going to be crucified. And on the third day, he is going to rise again. What was that stuff about resurrection? That was really weird. That was really weird. He doesn't, we need to help Jesus understand that he's a military conqueror and he's going to wipe out the Romans and any Jewish resistance is going to be thwarted as well. I guess who was right and guess who was wrong. Jesus' mission to become the sin bearer of the world, to a message of reconciliation that God was not holding men's sins against them anymore. It's a powerful word. The angel's challenge, remember his words. Then they remembered Jesus' words. This, 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 he told us about this. 
But you and I are called to become ambassadors of reconciliation. One of the things that the Lord had us do when I was hiding away in the office as a first-year pastor at Christian uh, Church of the Redeemer, then to become Christian Renewal Church, Jeff Marks came knocking on the door and saying, Pastor Scott, I know you're in there. I see your car outside. He says, God wants you to come to pastor's meetings. I said, hi, Jeff. And I opened the door and I said, how did you know that I was here? He says, I see your car parked right off front. If you're going to be hiding from me, you better park your car in a better place. And <laughs> it's a true story. <clears throat> he talked me into coming to pastor's meetings. So much so that I found that meeting with other pastors could be a place of refuge and strength where we laugh together, where we cry together, where we encourage one another. And then everything that happened in the next years from, Tammy, you remember you were, the, you were one of the ones that helped us vote. We were at Iris Walker's house and we took a, a show of hands. How many of you feel we should move the church from the uh, Hamilton Wenham uh, Center to the church in Salem? How many of you were there at that meeting? You remember that meeting, Iris Walker's house? It was an incredible moment. That moment came about because of my connection with other pastors. I got to know Joe Cost. And every significant move of our church was directed by my connection with other pastors. Because I was reconciled with my brothers, my Spanish Latino brothers. Um, there was a Russian uh, brethren who... Uh, had Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox things, uh, a Catholic priest by the name of Father Louis Bourgeois. It didn't matter what denominational stripe he had because God was into the ministry of reconciliation. And I was supposed to be a part of what he was doing, not doing my own thing. And I had to learn how to obey what God was calling me to do. Ambassadors of reconciliation you have to listen to what the Lord is saying. But number two, we also must become conquerors of despair. If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, you have a ticket to become a conqueror of despair in a hopeless world. Peter was there at the tomb, as you read. He didn't have it figured out yet. If you think you have it all figured out, please come and talk to me. I'll show you where you don't if you have, if you have the chutzpah to listen. But God is at work, and he's wanting to teach us how to conquer despair in a hopeless world. Peter finds the empty tomb, but he has not yet in this context found the resurrected Jesus. It's one thing to find the empty tomb, but it's quite another thing to actually find the resurrected Jesus standing in front of you. It says, bending over, he saw the strips of living. This is uh, uh, Luke 24, 12. Lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself, what in the world is going on here? There's no way he was a believer in Jesus at this point in time. Just totally bewildered. How many of you sometimes are just totally bewildered? You believe that something's going on, but I don't know what it is. This is Bob Dylan said in his song on Highway 61. And you know something is going on, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? <laughs> That's a great song. But we learn to become conquerors of despair in a hopeless world. Peter at the empty tomb. Peter was the one who denied Jesus three times. He called down curses upon himself and said, I never knew the man. I never knew the man. So Peter had a lot at stake in this. But look at First Peter. You have it down on in your outline there. First Peter 1.3. New birth into a living hope, Peter wrote. Uh, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Powerful, powerful moment of resurrection glory. Powerful moment when Jesus sees Peter for the first time. Uh, the resurrected Jesus, he says, Shalom, peace, my peace be to you. 
Peter at the empty tomb, but then Peter with the visual reality of Jesus walking through the doors. The one who denied him three times, would Jesus condemn him and tell him of his failures and his shortcomings? Instead, he says, Shalom. Shalom, peace. The Prince of Peace embracing Peter. One of my favorite actors is Audrey Hepburn. You have a little bit of a synopsis there in your outline. How many of you know who Audrey Hepburn is? And you don't get her confused with Catherine Hepburn. Can't do that. If you're an Audrey Hepburn fan, you cannot get her confused with Catherine Hepburn, okay? Real important. And I just finally got that down this last week. But uh, Audrey Hepburn in the film, Audrey, more than an icon, made in 2020, uh, from a depressed starlet to a champion for starving children of Somalia. One of her uh, children, she, uh, Audrey Hepburn, awesome actor, uh, awesome philanthropist, just a, a beautiful woman of God, to be sure, from a depressed starlet to a, a champion for starving children of Somalia. One of her grandchildren, uh, or maybe it was, uh, it was a granddaughter, okay. My dad said about my grandmother, that is Audrey, that the best kept secret about Audrey is that she was very sad. She battled sadness. She battled depression. So said her daughter, Emma Hepburn Fair. Her parents were divorced when she was sick, six. The father left. It certainly stayed with me the rest of my life. My father leaving us left me insecure for life, disabled for life, perhaps. She experienced two bitter divorces in her own personal life. She had a miscarriage, the loss of a little baby in her womb. But her sadness of heart sensitized her to the starving children of Africa in Latin America, Ethiopia, Somalia. Catherine Hepburn started denying roles in her mid-40s and saying, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do the outward anymore. It's not who I am. And she began turning down lead, leading movie roles uh, when others would have grabbed them and killed for them. Seriously. Her fame as an actor opened doors for her to raise millions of dollars with her message to the world. Uh, one of the directors, the ambassadors of UNICEF, United Nations International Children's Fund, her fame as, as an actor opened up doors for her to raise millions of dollars with her message to the world. She frequently spoke of hunger of the human body, but also hunger for the soul, for love. Though Hepburn died at 63 of an acute form of cancer, which she possibly contracted while in Somalia, they didn't really know at that time. After reaching thousands of suffering from malnutrition and starvation, there was this one picture that is just so so deeply moving, she was holding a Somalian child in her hands who was dying of malnutrition, who I believe died in her arms. Um, and what she did and how she went out, fearlessly taking care of those who were ill and those who were sick. She discovered her purpose in this life through these tragedies and used her fame for a redemptive cause. I, I was speaking with Polly Wilson this last week, and Polly said to me, Scott, don't forget to tell them about Meyer, Meyer Zacks. I said, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. And it was when I discovered a redemptive purpose for myself before I knew Dory. It was, I was 12 years old, and is what the Jewish people would call your bar mitzvah year. And my father w was someone who liked uh, really good clothing. My father worked in uh, Sisson's um, a clothing store in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, he would occasionally go to Meyer Zach's tailor shop on North Avenue in Milwaukee. And one day my dad said, Scott, I'm going to ask Meyer to show you something today that's going to change your life. 
and in ear and out the other ear. It was springtime. Uh, the Milwaukee Braves were playing, and I was also going to go and buy a new baseball bat. So my father gave me both of those things to think about. But then we were visiting Meyer Zacks, the Jewish tailor, on North Avenue in Milwaukee, and Meyer said, is it okay, Jack, to show um, your son my concentration marks on the numbers? So he rolled up his sleeves, rolled up his sleeves, and showed me the concentration numbers from his whole family died in the Holocaust. He was the only one who survived. The tears came down his eyes when he said I was the only one that survived, and all of a sudden I was crying and I had no idea why. No idea why. Twelve years old, looking forward to getting a new baseball bat later in the day, a Henry Aaron baseball bat, no less. And um, it just deeply shook my soul. And then later on, years here, I'm pastoring a Christian renewal church, and our church was doing an outreach with some Jewish people. And they asked me to, why are you involved in doing these things? And I said, well, let me tell you about Meyer Zacks, a Jewish tailor that I met when I was 12 years old. And all of a sudden, all the Jewish people were in tears. And um, David Moldau walked up to him and said, Scott, you are a witness of the Holocaust. And you have to carry this with you your life, your whole life. You are a witness of the Holocaust because you met someone who was at Auschwitz. And it's going to change the rest of your life. You were, and then we bumped into someone by the name of Marv and Polly Wilson, one of the leaders on planet Earth of a reconciliation movement with Jews. And anyone who became a part of this church had to be in sympathy with that vision. Otherwise, they wouldn't want to stay here because it was too much concern for Jews. Not, a much, not enough conversion of Jews. Too much just friendship with Jews which is not what Marv would appreciate here, Herding said. But it was a powerful, powerful moment. We learn how to become those who can conquer despair in this world. Audrey Hepburn, amazing servant of the Lord. Only God knows where she is in eternity. I have a sneaking suspicion, I know. But uh, we must learn how to become ambassadors of reconciliation. We must learn how to become conquerors of despair like Audrey Hepburn did. Number three, we must become witnesses of the throne of lightning. A curious verse uh, in, in our uh, text is so powerful. Um, while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes with gleaming lightning stood beside them. These are two angels who are there at the throne of God. I believe they were there even in those moments and they came and helped Jesus and empowered him and brought the word, come forth in the name of God's love. Come forth. Two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning. Remember Revelation 1.6. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. Matthew 17.2, the transfiguration. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Revelation 4.5, from the throne of God came flashes of lightning. These are not special effects. This is the real thing. Harnessed fire lightning bolts and the resurrection power and authority. Satan could not stop or delay the resurrection for one moment. Satan could not delay the resurrection for one second. A lot of people get freaked out about what the enemy and what Satan is doing in this world, and I totally understand. But how many of you serve a risen Savior? He's in the world today. I know that he is with us no matter what men may say. We have a living hope. Thank you, Tammy. God bless you. You did such a good job today reading the call to worship for us. God bless you. You're especially loved, dear Lord, Tammy, by God. God's love is so high, so powerful, so deep in your heart. We become witnesses of the throne of lightning. No special effects needed. Number four, we become witnesses of the redemptive keys. 
freeing our lives from addictions that kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. I hold the keys of death and Hades. He took them right from the prince of darkness, and he has them. Encounters with Jesus will set your and my life free. Jesus is the bondage breaker. Anybody read Neil Anderson's book, The Bondage Breaker? We studied that, oh, it had to be 20 years ago in our church. We were doing it in Christian ed. We had small groups when our church was about 60 or 70. It was a great book, a great book, and it's still relevant for today. But Jesus is the great bondage breaker. We serve him in this world today. And we're not here to count heads and say you're a success or a failure. There's a, oh, no, I won't go there. Okay, Dory, I won't go there, I promise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us today. You can take that outline home if you want to. We become ambassadors of reconciliation to a badly divided world and church. Viggo Mortensen, who played Aragorn in The Lord of the Rings, said this coming pandemic is going to cause a polarization of planet Earth amongst politicians and others, and he was right. There is still a deep abiding polarization in this country. Viggo Mortensen was exactly correct. He was like a prophet. But Lord, we pray. Uh, how many of you are saying, because I know Jesus is risen from the dead, I want to be an ambassador of re reconciliation, not someone who promotes more division and superiority and arrogance. I want to become someone who is like Jesus. He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. He has committed to us a message of reconciliation. The angel's challenge, remember what he said. Lord, we commit the day into your hands. Thank you for these men and women who are here today. And thank you for uh, Pastor Santos Villegas as he comes in for the Latino Spanish service. Lord, bless our dear brothers and sisters. But Lord, we thank you for your hand upon our lives here. Lead us and guide us on paths of righteousness. Let us become ambassadors of reconciliation. How many of you want to be a conqueror of despair? Just reach out and take it from the Lord right now. Become a conqueror of despair like, like Audrey. Was not afraid to go to Somalia. Was not afraid to go in difficult places and be used by God there when other Hollywood actors wouldn't dare set foot in Somalia. She frequently spoke of the hunger of the human body, but also the hunger of the soul for love. And she was cured of her own sadness and sorrow. Thank you, Abba. How many of you want to be witnesses of the throne of lightning? Believe in a supernatural God that when you reach out your hand and pray for the sick, pray for those with a brain tumor, the lightning fire of God can flow through you. How many of you believe it happens today? Lord, for uh, the Sanders uh, son-in-law, Chris and Hannah Grace, all of a sudden, there they were, and he has a brain tumor. Lord, we all believe you and trust you that you are healing Chris right now. Thank you for those who are fasting and praying, Lord, and Lord, for the little girl that was visiting us today, Lord Jesus, dancing up here a little bit, moments that I will never forget. But Lord, we thank you and uh, welcome the children to, to the pulpit to, be, to speak to us and preach to us. And we become witnesses of the redemptive keys, freeing our lives from addictions that steal, kill, and destroy. Behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. How many of you believe that Jesus is risen? And he holds the keys of death and Hades. Encounter with Jesus will set our lives free. Jesus is the bondage breaker. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Abba.
So go forth, brothers and sisters, receive what God has for you. Receive the power, the lightning power to overcome despair. Receive the lightning throne of God authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, to overcome all of the power of the enemy. And then when you say, come out, there is no more demonic presence left in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we commit this Easter Sunday into your hands. Thank you for those who are going to be going Tuesday night to Liberty Tree Mall to see Come Out. And thank you for those who go and see at Liberty Tree Mall, uh, His Only Son, story of Abraham and Yitzhak, laughter. So, Lord, we bless you for all the good things you're doing. Lord, help us to see it. Lord, help us not to develop a hardened heart or a critical spirit. In the name of Jesus, heal all of our hearts. And everyone said amen. Amen. amen.